Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the 59th meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via Starleaf and our witnesses will be briefing via Starleaf. Sorry, Chair. Members, can I just check if you can hear us? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Chair. That's grand. So the meeting will be broadcast live when open to the public and a recording will be made available on the committee's webpage on the Assembly website. And just to remind members to mute their devices when they're not speaking. So moving on then, we have item number one, which is apologies. And we don't have any apologies this morning. Um, so unless members are aware of any. So moving on then, item number two, which is the draft minutes. Um, there is a copy of the draft minutes from the meeting on the 21st at page four of your packs. Are members content that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Thank you. Um, so then moving on at 2.2, there's a copy of the draft record of decisions from the meeting on the 21st at page 12 in your pack. Are members content that those are an accurate uh, record? Thank you. Yeah. Moving on then to item number three, Chair's Business. So there's a few things here in Chair's Business this morning. Um, first of all, just to remind members that there's an informal meeting tomorrow morning with UK Finance and some of the banks here. The meeting is scheduled for 10.30 tomorrow morning. Um, there is a clerk's memo at page three of your table papers um, providing some of the background information to the meeting. There is an agenda for the informal meeting at page eight of your table papers and a competition compliance statement at page nine of the table papers, which UK Finance has issued prior to this meeting. And it sets out the obligations of the banks attending the meeting under UK and EU competition law. UK Finance has asked members to be aware of this statement and the parameters of the engagement. Um, there is also correspondence in your pack from Danske Bank at page 11 of your table papers in advance of the meeting, setting out the support it has provided to customers. So just to remind members that this meeting will be via Zoom and the ID and password can be found in your calendar on the meeting invite and the above papers will also be attached to the meeting invite for ease of access during the meeting. Shall we reissue the invite just so everybody has it fresh? Okay, thank you, Peter. So then moving on, um, the NI Affairs Committee, if members remember, had invited specific Assembly Committee chairs to meet with it on a regular basis to discuss um, respective scrutiny of the protocol. The committee had agreed that I had attend these meetings and so far two of them have taken place. Um, while the engagement obviously is welcome, it may be preferable that this continues on the basis of correspondence rather than in the meeting format so that members can be kept informed and that discussions remain, um, I suppose, focused on, on the scrutiny of the protocol from a committee perspective uh, rather than, um, I suppose, political exchanges in, in, um, in private meetings. Chair, it also means that it's easier to actually get a response from the committees involved. It's been really, really difficult to timetable um, where all chairs, all relevant chairs from the Assembly can be there. So if members are agreed then that the committee would write to the NI Affairs Committee to, to indicate that our input will be in the for form of correspondence going forward, just so that all members can have um, a sight of that as well. If members are content. Thank you. Thank you. And then just finally, under Chair's business, today, as members are likely aware, is International Workers' Memorial Day. Um, we have received uh, correspondence on that, um, including from the Speaker, regarding marking International Workers' Memorial Day and the Irish uh, Congress of Trade Unions has called for a minute silence at 11am to mark International Workers' Memorial Day 2021, in particular to remember those who've lost their lives during the pandemic. So if members are agreed, we will be pausing the committee uh, meeting at 11 a.m. for a minute silence, if members are content with that. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on then to item number four, which is our departmental briefing on the budget position. Um, there is a clerk's memo at page 17 of our PACs. Um, there is a copy of the oral statement from the finance minister on further funding allocations at page 20. There is the most recent written briefing paper on the budget position from the Department dated the 2nd of April at page 29. There is a copy of the Finance Minister's oral statement of the 27th of April on the final budget at page 15 of table papers and then a copy of the budget papers at page 23 of table papers. And the focus of this morning's briefing is the 2021-22 budget. 
The Finance Committee has requested that, the commu that our committee communicates its view on the Department's planned budget, and just to remind members also that the budget for 2021-22 should be viewed in the context of annual budgets with considerable in-year movement to accommodate the Department's COVID response. So we have our, our witnesses. Um, can I welcome to the meeting Sharon Hetherington, who is Director of Finance at DFE, and Joanna Park, who is uh, Financial Management at DFE. And if I hand over to yourselves to make an opening statement, and then we can open it up to members for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Chair, as you said, I'm joined by my colleague Joanna Park to brief you today on the 21-22 budget. In February, Mike Brennan, David Malcolm and I briefed the committee on the draft budget, setting out the implications for DfE following the executive agreeing a final budget on the 1st of April, a committee briefing paper um, updated members on the final budget position, which um, for DfE did not change from the draft budget presented in February. This week, um, a paper will also issue to the committee setting out how the final budget will be reflected in the main estimate. So I'll briefly recap on some of the issues covered. The DFE resource Dell baseline remains the same as last year at 805 million, with just short of 16 million of additional non-baseline funding um, to cover EU exit, EU matched funding and funding to reflect the additional costs for universities of the 2021 level out workings over the summer. To allow DfE to live within its 21-22 flat cash budget allocation, budgets have been realigned across business areas based on historic spend to address inescapable pressures. In addition, DfE has started the 21-22 financial year with an overcommitment of 7.3 million. This is 100,000 more than 2021, but it is considered manageable. In addition to the final budget allocation, the executive has agreed 900,000 of funding for the City of Derry Airport Public Service Obligation Route. And furthermore, Treasury has agreed to provide just over 12 million um, for the increased work arising from the Northern Ireland Protocol. Looking at COVID allocations, Outside of the final budget allocation, the executive committed to providing funding of almost 276 million resource Dell for the Economic Recovery Action Plan, of which 145 million is for the High Street Stimulus Scheme, and just short of 131 million is allocated to be used at DfE's discretion for economic support measures. The flexibility is welcomed by DfE and will ensure that funding is allocated to where it's needed in an agile way, better supporting the, the economy. Um, it is anticipated that DOF will formally allocate the Economic Recovery Action Plan funding and the quota funding shortly as part of a post-budget allocations exercise. As members will be aware, DfE continues to be responsible for the CRBSS as the health restrictions continue. The executive has set aside 81 million in 21-22 to fund the CRBSS and also the DOF-led LRSS. The executive has also agreed to fund the extension of the large tourism and hospitality scheme from 100 million that health had indicated they may not require. It is anticipated that the cost of running the two DFE business support schemes to the 23rd of May, um, which I think is when the latest restrictions end, is um, around £32 million. Pounds. DfE has also secured £23 million pounds from the Northern Ireland office. Eight, that is £8 million for Invest NI to develop overseas locations over the next two financial years. So that's reflected as £4 million in the current year. Um, and also um, within that amount is £15 million for skills and that is across three financial years. So that will be reflected as £5 million in the current year. Turning to Capital Dale, DfE has been allocated almost £90 million, um, of capital and the Minister has used this allocation to prioritise funding um, of £20 million for the Economic Recovery Action Plan projects. The Executive has also agreed to provide an additional £11 million of capital for the Economic Recovery Action Plan in the year. Details of the capital projects were provided to the Committee in the Budget Briefing Paper. In addition, the Finance Minister has agreed allocations to DfE in year for Project Stratum of £42 million and just short of £3 million for the Graduate Entry Medical School. The Department's financial transaction capital bid of £34.7 million was met in full, which was £30 million for the Ulster University and Greater Belfast Development, 
four and a half million for Invest NI and two hundred thousand for Catalyst. On balance, what I have set out is a very positive outcome for DFE and will allow vital work to aid economic recovery to commence. Chair, that's a quick summary of the 21-22 budget. Joanna and I will do our best to answer any questions that you might have and to provide additional clarification and explanation on the 21-22 budget position of the department. Um, our knowledge doesn't extend to the policy detail of some of the things covered in the final budget and to provide um, detail on those issues. I know the committee will hear from officials in the coming weeks um, on the Economic Recovery Action Plan and you've also been engaged um, with colleagues on the various COVID schemes. Um, where Joanna and I cannot give you precise or complete answers on the final budget, we will be happy to write to the clerk to provide the necessary explanations or where a question is specific to a business area, we will ask our policy colleagues to provide a response. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Sharon. Um, very helpful, as, as always, to get that overview. Um, and I, I appreciate that, that some of the questions that, that perhaps you will be asked will be of more of a policy nature, um, and we can get um, more detailed responses if necessary. So we, we will understand if there's complete detail that you aren't able to give. Um, and I, I guess my first one might be in that category. But of the £12.2 that has been allocated for uh, protocol issues, is there any detail at this stage of how that will be broken down? Um, yes, we do. Um, I mean, that, that is broken down. Um, it's mostly contributing to salaries of people that are taking forward um, sort of the additional work as a result of the protocol. Um, you know, so there's salaries in Invest NI, there's salaries in the department. Um, Joanna, do you, do you have any more sort of detail on, on that that you want to provide? Yes, Chair, the breakdown of our 12.2 allocation to meet the increased costs as a result of the protocol um, are, are subject to what HMT uh, have allocated through the bid. So the largest element of that is 5.8 million, and that is for work to be carried out in relation to to protocol and trade policy. There is all, there are the next largest allocation is in relation to energy and the salaries around the additional work that will be taken forward for, for energy. There is also an additional allocation for trading standards, the health and safety executive, and as Sharon has pointed out, um, some salaries for Invest NI, there's Intertrade and Consumer Council. Uh, after the meeting, I'm willing to provide the table and breakdown that Treasury have provided us with, if that's helpful. Yeah, that would be brilliant. Thank you. And, and that, that's just useful to get that um, overview. Um, can I ask about the, the money that has been allocated or been awarded from NIO? Um, what, what is that in respect of? Um, so that's in two parts. And... Um, as I've said, there's eight million for Invest NI over two years. Um, so that is to allow Invest NI um, to broaden its overseas reach. Um, and then the second part is in terms of skills. So there is 15 million um, pounds over three years that will contribute to the skill strategy. Um, uh, you know, sort of been taken forward by the department, and and obviously, you know that that is under the economic recovery action plan as well, because skills is um, a, a pillar within that. Oh, I guess my my question was more why had it come from NIO um, as opposed to what? Right. Yep. Um, so I, I think I'm going to have to ask um, the policy official who was dealing with that. Um, to come back to you and specifically why. No, that, that's grand, thank you. Um, and then just finally from myself for now, um, in, the, on, or in the reduced re requirements back in February, there was a 2.5 million underspend on the self-employed, or sorry, in the newly self-employed scheme. Um, and obviously the committee had um, been asking for that to be extended out to include other people in it for, for some time. And, and we know that finance had given some um, discretion as to how uh, the COVID allocations would be spent. So I was just wondering why was that money not utilised um, in an, another kind of budget or another policy area on, on terms of COVID support or to extend that particular scheme? Yeah, um, so I'll ask Joanna to come in on the detail of this, um, but 
My recollection back to that was we had surrendered that before the flexibility was granted, but Joanna will have more of the detail of that than me. That's correct. We had surrendered that before. That was the fork basic based on the forecast spend across that scheme. However, in respect of all of the other schemes, when the new policy or the executive agreement came in for flexibility in February, we have managed the spend across all of our schemes to enable us to then move money where it needed to go when there was an increased demand in a scheme and maybe the forecast hadn't come in for the you know, the demand in other schemes. In regards to the extension, often that would be a policy decision and we would need to refer back to policy officials on why certain ones weren't extended. Yeah. No, thanks for that. That's very helpful. Um, can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Good morning, um, Sharon uh, and Ronan. Thank you for your briefing so far. Um, I, I suppose I have a general question um, to Sharon. Sharon, where do you think the pinch points or the challenges are going to be in this particular budget? Um, well, I think Sinead has set out um, with a 7.3 million over commitment. So obviously, from where I'm concerned, that's one of my focuses to make sure that that is managed and we actually do manage um, to, to live within um, our allocations. Um, I think whenever Mike was here the last time, you know, we did speak to the committee about the stamping situation. And I think we can't divorce that from the budget and what the spend is for. Um, so you know we're sort of I, i'm sitting on one hand with this 7.3 million over commitment and i'm looking at the vacancies and thinking that's probably the reason why, why it's manageable but obviously you know if we can't get our posts filled then the pinch point will be will be the challenge in delivering what we have been given the money you, you know to spend um so you know at the minute um this is looking fine people, people have plans to spend this money but unless vacancies um, are are managed, I think the challenge will be in making sure we deliver what we what we're setting out to do. Yeah, yeah, and it's not a great way to save money either through no, no, um, absolutely. You know, you're given money for a reason, and the right thing yeah. to do is is to deliver that. Yeah. And, and you know, that's what we want to do, and are very much focused on doing within DFE. But I think that's one of the real challenges for us. Um, yeah, well, that's interesting. Yeah, and the other, the other, just for a wee bit more clarity, um, Sharon, regarding the financial transactions capital and the fifty-five point three million um, that remains unallocated, um, some of this is going to be returned. Can you give me uh, how how much is going to be returned, uh, and for what reasons were we unable to spend or take down the loans? Um, sorry, I'm not sure. The FTC. Like, yeah, so so the FTC in our 21-22 budget is 34.7 and it's allocated out at the minute. So we would believe that would be spent. Um, you know, because FTC across the block is quite reduced in 21-22. Right, just in the paper that we have in front of us, it says unfortunately 55.3 million FTC capital remains unallocated and while we can carry forward some FTC into 2021-22, it is never known that again some of this capital will be lost. That's the finance minister statement. Is that the finance minister statement? Yeah. That's about yeah. the overall block position. Yeah, I, yeah but have so you got any? Uh -huh. Yeah, so, so that's not position in DFE. Um, you know, Joanna, Joanna, have you anything else you want to add? No, I, I think maybe Sinead, you're asking, do we have any maybe other FTC projects to bring yes. forward? At yes. this point, I'm not aware of any outside of what because we, we got our full allocation. Okay, and then just one quick uh, question as well regarding the student hardship money 27.3 million allocation. Um, or understanding from speaking to students that it's very difficult to to get students students hardship. Is this allocation is is, is this going to be spent 
um, within within the, the confines of that year? Uh, and is there a mechanism that maybe some of that money can be actually put into strategic support grants rather than actually hardship funds? Um, so I think, Sinead, that the amount you're talking about is in relation to the year we've just finished. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, DFE have paid that money to the universities and they were to deliver the schemes. And my understanding is that that's kind of on track. I think in terms of this year, um, you know, that money can't be carried forward into it. Not that I expect there to be a surplus at this point in time. I'm certainly not aware that there would be um but you know we have allocated uh, hardship money to the universities in line with last year so i think it's just short of three million pounds um but we have also made it clear that um if further money is needed you know we're, we are willing to listen to that okay that's great thank you very much thanks Sinead. can we bring john o'diet into the spotlight please Good morning, Cheryl. Thank you uh, for your presentation to, to the team from the economy uh, department thus far. I, I note in the paper there was a £30 million FTC bid in relation to the Ulster University's building in Belfast. Was that a scheduled payment or is that in relation to the recent media speculation that the project is running significantly over cost? Um, no, that's a scheduled um, bid in, in line with the sort of uh, payment requirements for, for that um, sort of development. Are you aware of any bids being made to the department for further costs for that no. project? No bids have been made um, to me for that project. Okay, thank you. In, in regards then uh, to other matters, I'll just mention them both again and you can respond. Uh, the lecturers pay dispute, has there been any bids made in relation to resolving that issue? And also the call from the Assembly and this committee that the £500 COVID disruption payment is expanded to include more students. Was there any bid made by the department uh, to cover those costs? So in terms of the FE lecturers pay dispute, um, you know, we have put a marker bid in with DOF, but um, we're really waiting on um, a more firmed up proposal to, you know, allow us to sort of more fully engage with DOF around that. But yes, we have we have been engaging um, with them. And in terms of the £500 payment, um, you know, there's there's been no there's been no bid made in the current financial year. The five hundred pounds related to the previous financial year. Um. So so there's there's been no bid made into the centre for that at present. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, John. Can we bring John Stewart into the spotlight, please? You might be muted, John. I think that's it now. It was yeah. not mute. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Sharon and Joanna, um, for your questions so far. A couple of my um, issues have been dealt with already. Just one, in terms of the economic recovery plan, um, I think one of the fundamental flaws of Stormont over many years has been launching great schemes, and this one has been well received, although not perfect, but it's been well received. But then committing to it for a year and then coming up with another grand plan, funding it and starting again. And I think the key to any success is to have a continuity. Um, and a workable solution. So my question sort of stems around, you know, um, how important it is and what plans there are to continue to fund in year the um, the actual economic recovery plan year on year. Has that been looked at and to what degree um, do you think that is possible? Um, so I think I think what you're asking probably goes to the heart of public finances in a way and how we've been dealing with 
one year budget settlements um you know and i suppose in terms of how treasury allocate us our money while we can make representations we we sort of are where we are in terms of we have only got a one year settlement um you know the economic recovery plan and i know officials will come um in the next few weeks and sort of brief in more detail on that um, but where there are tales arising from that, and I'm thinking particularly, you know, there's apprenticeship interventions there. Um, you know, we have we have made that known to the executive um, that you know, sort of that there are tales arising out of this work. I think it's not dissimilar to the interventions that um, we we put in place in the um, last financial year and you know they, they were funded um, so so while the executive can't give a commitment to fund be, beyond the current year because that's only the budget that it has um, I think there is a recognition that you know, there will be some tales arising from this. Okay thanks for that yeah that's exactly the point it was getting to. Um, another aspect um, I've been contacted by a lot contacted by a lot of businesses who are looking over to England and Wales and Scotland at the um, business restart scheme. There's a grant scheme to restart businesses. Was there any bonnet consequentiality for that and was there any um, notion given towards replicating a similar scheme in this current financial year and was anything allocated towards anything like that? Um, I am not sure about the Barnet consequential, um, you know, sometimes, and particularly because of COVID, sometimes last year those Barnet consequentials were not coming in advance, so I'm really okay. not sure, and it's more a question for, for DOF, um, but as you know, if something comes through in a Barnet consequential, it doesn't necessarily find its yeah. way into the Department for Economy, just because that's what um, kind of give, give rise to the consequential. Um, in ter terms of actual schemes, um, that really would be a question for the policy colleagues and I'm sure whenever you're getting your briefing on the recovery action plan that will have been you know part, part of their thinking so I'd, I think it's probably better um, if, if they take the lead on that. Okay thanks Sharon I'll save that one for them. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you sir. <laughs> thanks Donna and sit down. Thanks John. Can we bring Mervyn into the spotlight please? Hello. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. And um, thanks to Sharon and Joanne for the presentation. Just a couple of things in relation to paragraph 8 of the paper. When 201 million of resource Dell was allocated, why write and say that when we go to paragraph 9, that then that was addressed in the context of the economic recovery plan. So yeah, in, in real terms, we got more than what were the original resource Dell bids by some 80 some odd million. Is that, is that, am I reading that correctly? Um, I, think, I think I'd like to just sort of unpack that a wee bit. Um, so we had submitted um, just over two hundred thousand um, pounds of, or sorry, million um, of resource sale bids as part of the comprehensive spending review. So that was back in October, um, and then obviously sort of events change and bids get refined. And within that two hundred and one million, we also had two marker bids, um, one for economic recovery and one for skills. Um, so as we move through the budgeting process. Those bids were refined and the Economic Recovery Action Plan was developed. Um, so it's not exactly comparing like with like. Um, I, think, I think we have done very well in terms of our allocation. But what I would say is there's a big number there and that's the High Street um, Stimulus Scheme and it's 145 million. So it wasn't in the original 201 um, because that preceded the High Street um, Scheme, but it is in the economic recovery action plan. So um, at a high level, yes, these are these are our COVID bids. Um, there are there are sort of ups and downs within them that sort of make just comparing two numbers um, sort of not quite as reliable as, as we can underneath the substance of it. And thanks for that Sharon. Does that in any way create a risk for the department at a later stage in the financial cycle? 
Um, no, I think, I mean, what we are saying is the Economic Recovery Action Plan as a package covered all the beds that, that the department felt it required. Um, and that has been funded in full. So, so where we are sitting at the minute, I don't think there there is a risk there that you know there are things not funded. I think one of the things that COVID has probably taught all of us is nobody quite knows what's coming around the corner. But, but you know, as we said at the minute, um, as a department, we are content that that's fully funded. Okay. And finally, uh, Sharon, um, it was alluded to or was made reference to by some colleagues earlier. In regards to the, the FTC that had gone to the Greater Belfast University project, that's FTC. Was 147 million that was previously given that also FTC? Um, I'm not sure. We get, I know that um, this so this financial sorry the financial year that's just passed we gave them FTC and we also gave them 25 million of capital. Um, I'm just not over the whole detail of that. I don't know, Joanna, we may have to get somebody to come back to you on that. Joanna, are you able to pick that up? Or no, I, I, uh, I think we'll come back on that. We'll get you okay. a breakdown of that then. That, that, would be, that would be very useful, Joanna. And uh, so, uh, Chair, thank you. That's my question. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mervyn. Um, can I just pick up on the some of the bids that are li li are listed there under paragraph nine? The five million for the business events fund. Do you do you have any detail around what that is? Obviously, the committee have been calling for support for the event sector for some time. So, um, it would just be useful if you have any detail on that. Yeah, I, I think um, we may have to get somebody to come back to you. But Joanna, do you have any sort of high level detail on it? No, I just know that that was a bid that was submitted by uh, Tourism Northern Ireland, um, and it is to support the events sector, as you've pointed out, Chair. So I can get more information on that, but just to point out that bid is currently not met with inside the budget. Okay. Okay, thanks for that. Um, no, that, that's grand. I don't think we have any other questions, so um, I thank you very much. I think, sorry, sorry I think just, just, just to follow on what Joanna said, why you know, that bit isn't met because we have the flexibility. We are hopeful that, um, you know, as the year progresses, we will be able to address that. So that's sort of why we haven't highlighted it as a sort of key risk at the minute. And we're hoping that the flexibility will allow us to manage it. And so actually you've just prompted another question for me in relation to the discretion to spend within that 131 million. Um, is that similar to the discretion, I suppose, that was given in relation to the COVID allocations from February? Is it that same mechanism that is being utilised there? Yes, that is our understanding, um, which, which, you know, sort of just made such a difference to being able to manage those various pots of money and really utilise the funding effectively as we work towards the year end. It was really beneficial. And is there, I suppose, high level conditions applied to it, to, the, to that pot of funding as to what it can be spent on? Well, you know, sort of routinely, we would always be engaging with our DOF um, supply team. Um, so, you know, if there were any grey areas, we would be engaging in a conversation with them. Um, and then obviously, if, um, you know, we felt it was something that really would be better come back to the executive, we would do that. Um, but, you know, we do feel that the Economic Recovery Action Plan covers quite a broad range of um, economic initiatives. Um, so, you know, we, we are really grateful for the flexibility that, that's there, but, you know, it is with controls, of course. Okay, thank you. Joanna, were you looking in there as well? Or? No. Oh. Well, that's great. Look, thank you for the, the update. And sure, if there's anything additional that the committee wants to, to ask about, we, we'll be in touch as well. So thank you very much. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, we are, are, unless anybody has anything specific they want to suggest as actions coming out of that, we're going to be moving into the closed session. So, yeah, if you want to bring everybody back up, I wonder if Chair, what, what we might suggest doing is because we hadn't scheduled the other briefing until 11, although our official is here, if we um, do other business until 11 o'clock when we have the minute silence for International um, Workers Memorial Day, that, that's probably the most efficient way to do it before we go into the closed session. Yep, members are happy enough, we'll do that.
So we're going to move on then to, to matters arising. Um, so 6.1, there is uh, page 56 of your pack, a response from the Minister following the committee's request for her to meet with NUS USI regarding the extension of the COVID disruption payment. Um, the Minister has outlined that pressures on her diary meant she was not available to meet with NUS USI for a number of weeks and the NUS USI were unwilling to accept an alternative meeting with senior officials unless discussion of the extension of the COVID disruption payment to FE students was on the agenda. The Minister states that NUS USI are in regular contact with officials um, and members have probably seen some um, discussion around this um, online this week and the NUS USI are having a day of action tomorrow. Um, so I guess members, we would like to get some views as to how people would like to proceed on this. And I think Sinead and John are both indicating to come in. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, I'm very disappointed with um, the Minister's response uh, to the letter. Um, it was very dismissive um, of, of the students. And we all realise that our ministers are very busy. Uh, and we do realise that the Minister has um, a, an extremely large portfolio. However, um, we're all meeting via Zooms. There's 24 hours in the day. Uh, I know our ministers work late into the evening uh, as well. Uh, and really the courtesy of um, even a 15 minute meeting uh, would have been very, very welcome. And I think the minister still has time uh, to reflect on her response uh, and meet up with the students. Uh, and I certainly, from my party's perspective, will be supporting their day of action tomorrow because uh, I believe that they have a legitimate um, you know, issues in relation to COVID support. Uh, and they need to be heard. So uh, having said that, am I surprised at what the Minister's response is? No, I'm not, because we as a committee have been sitting here without any briefing from the Minister for the past 19 weeks. We haven't had a briefing from the committee since um, the Northern Ireland Protocol was put in place, since we actually formally left the European Union. We haven't had any briefing at all. Um, she hasn't sat in front of this committee to make any formal um, you know, briefing in relation to where we find ourselves within COVID or economic um, situation in relation to our businesses. So, uh, you know, she's coming toward to the committee on the 12th of May. That's 21 weeks since she sat before the committee for scrutiny. So am I surprised at the response to the, uh, the, the, the students? No, I'm not. But am I disappointed? Yes, I am. And I think she has a lot more that she should have been doing to help support. But there's other issues and other things out there, and she hasn't come near them either uh, to this committee. And it's very, very disappointing. Thanks, Sinead. Can we bring John in? Is John on mute? John, go ahead. You're on mute. Sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Well, uh, as Sinead has said, this is hugely disappointing. We're talking about a representative body of thousands of students uh, whose voices are important in, in this and many other debates. So I, I, as a previous minister, like I know diaries are busy. Time is tight. It's difficult to balance uh, demands from everyone on your time. But I think one way of balancing it is to ensure that when you're a, when a representative body wants to meet with you, that you make time to meet with them. You would always agree. There's, there's always uh, tensions in, in that role. Uh, but I think in terms of this occasion, the minister has made a mistake, and hopefully she will reflect on it and will make time in her diary uh, to meet with the student unions body. Thank Thanks, you. John. Um, and Stuart's looking to come in there as well. Uh, just very briefly, Chair, again, to... Um say that I support everything that Sinead and John have said, to encourage the Minister, if she or her officials are listening today, uh, to pick up the phone uh, or send an email to NUSUSI uh, and try and organise that meeting. Uh, and again, to, to just reiterate that I will also be supporting students in their day of protest tomorrow. So thank you. 
Thank you, Stuart. And Peter, uh, do you want to come in in relation to um, the issues around the COVID disruption payment? Yeah, Chair, members are aware that the committee's um, written a, a, a fair few times on this and set out its case very clearly on wanting to expand out the payment um, to students from here that are in um, itchy outside um, in Britain and in um, the Republic of Ireland, and also extension to FE students. In discussion with officials, what I'm aware of is they're still bottoming out what needs to be done. Um, I think initially we, we had assumed it might have just required secondary legislation. There is the potential for primary legislation to need to be brought to be able to make payments outside. Um, so I know officials are still bottoming that out. And once they've bottomed it out, they will bring that information. Um, but it, it's it seems that it's it's a, a lot more complex than we might have originally suspected. And that's in relation to the payments? That's to in the relation to the payments London, outside, Britain. yeah. Um, the FE students would be more straightforward? There are already yeah, um, mechanisms there, and, and the Minister has, has set out um, how other supports have been put in place in FE, and, and that's you know the, the reason she has given for not um, expanding the £500 out there. Yeah. So... I guess it's for members to decide how we want to proceed. We, we could reiterate our position that the Minister reconsiders and uh, quickly arranges a meeting with NUSI to listen to, or NUSUSI to listen to their concerns if members are content to do that. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Moving on then to 6.2, page 57 of, pack, of your packs, there is a letter from the Financial Services Union following last week's meeting thanking the committee for the opportunity to provide the oral briefing and for the committee's endorsement of the proposal to, um, to establish a banking forum. So we have already written to the Minister regarding uh, the setting up of that forum, so if members are content, we will just note this correspondence at this stage. Chair, sorry, um, I didn't get in there quick enough um, when you moved on. Would there be any merit in asking uh, the student union, would they like to come before the committee uh, and express, um, you know, their, their uh, or debrief us in, in, in exactly what their position is um, in the absence of being able to speak directly to the minister so that we can uh, then... Um, pass that back to the Minister directly whenever we meet her on the 12th of May. Yes, we can try and organise that, Sinead. Um, we met, as you will know, the, the, all of the student union representatives informally, but it would perhaps be useful to have them in front, front of the committee formally as well. Yeah, Chair, because of um, being able to do it ele ele electronically, um, we can get not only NS NUSUSI, but also the individual student union reps as well. So we go ahead and organise that. Thank you. Okay, moving on then to 6.3 at page 124 of table papers, there's a response from the department to the committee's request for information on how the government's guaranteed loan recovery scheme will apply in the north, given state aid rules and the application of the protocol. The department states that contrary to media reports, BEZ and the British Business Bank are not having to write separate rules for the recovery loan scheme on different sides of the Irish Sea, as was reported but they are having to develop additional guidance for the North Banks to clarify what is required by the state aid rules when the company receiving the loan is within the scope of Article 10 of the protocol. So just to advise members, the British Business Bank advised they were happy that although companies in the North may be subject to undertaking in difficulty rule, in all other respects, the conditions of the loans were exactly the same as for companies in Britain, not within the scope of the protocol. So if members are content, we will forward that response to the Finance Committee who originally raised this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Then at page 126 of table papers, there is a response from the Department to correspondence from a caravan owner regarding the payment of site fees during COVID and financial support provided to caravan site owners. The Department states that whilst there is sympathy for caravan owners who have continued to pay site fees for their static caravans, it is not for the Department to intervene on this as it is a contractual issue between the caravan owners and the owners or managers of the caravan park on which they are sited. Um, it is a bit disappointing that the Department is just viewing it in such simplistic terms because obviously this, I, I, I know I have been contacted by, by loads of caravan owners 
Um, however, I'm not sure if there's anything additional we can do in relation to this, Peter. Chair, as, as the department's pointed out, because it's private contracts, um, there, there's really no basis for them to intervene. Um, it's, it's more a case of individuals probably um, talking to the, the site owners, the site managers, and, and negotiating a, an appropriate discount where they haven't been able to access their caravan, but there's really no scope for the department to intervene there. Okay. Well, I suppose if members are agreed, we will forward that response to the individual who, who raised the matter with us. So 6.5 then at page 127 of table papers, there's a response from the finance uh, minister following the committee's request for information on the community renewal fund. The department states, or, sorry, the minister states that the executive endorsed a position on this fund in August 2020 <coughs> and it's summarised as seeking at least full replacement of the funding we would have received from EU sources along with the freedom to spend it according to our devolved priorities and <coughs> in accordance with the devolved debt settlement ongoing engagement with the UK government on the matter is described as not substantive. Neither the executive nor the Scottish and Welsh administrations have been able to input into the development of the fund's investment themes, policy framework or delivery structures. The finance minister is concerned at the delivery structures and the way in which it bypasses the executive and which redirects funding from structures established by our assembly and executive delivering according to local priorities. As members will be aware, that is similar to what the department had responded um, that we originally wrote to the finance minister on this about. Yeah, Chair, we, we'd written to um, the first and deputy first ministers as well as the economy minister, and um, we'd received correspondence from the economy minister on this, effectively saying the same, raising the same concerns as the finance minister has. We've not received a specific response from um, OFM DFM. But it's likely that you know that those are the concerns right across the executive. If members are content, um, we would ask that we would write to the um, the British Minister for Housing, Communities and Local Government, as you will see in that letter, who is responsible for the Community Renewal Fund and also the Shared Prosperity Fund, yes, um, to highlight the concerns in relation to this issue and also to seek assurances that there will be a mechanism for devolved priorities to be taken into account when the funding is allocated. If members are content to do that. Thank you. Okay, Peter. We just, I think we have time to... Keep going. Okay. Because we've we've about ten minutes, chair, before eleven o'clock. So moving on then to item number seven, which is the energy strategy consultation. There's a clerk's memo at page fifty nine outlining the consultation on the energy strategy and departmental priorities alongside the findings of our energy strategy micro inquiry. The purpose is to allow members to consider the themes which emerge from the micro inquiry as a, a I suppose a yardstick against which to measure the strategy. The Energy Strategy Policy Options Consultation is at page 99. And Peter, you're going to speak to this. Yeah, Chair, it, it really just the, the, the clerk's memo sets out where the committee's energy micro inquiry, energy strategy micro inquiry went and where the energy strategy consultation has gone. And, and that there is a, a, a significant amount of read across. Um, on, on a first reading, it does look like the consultation has hit all the areas and themes highlighted by the committee. Um, I suppose now really what, what has to happen is getting the analysis of responses back from the department and going through those, talking to stakeholders. Members will remember we'd already built up a stakeholder group um, for this and what we probably look to do is once we have an analysis of responses and we know generally what the views of stakeholders are to what the department has put out, we'll have another discussion uh, around that and then that'll help inform the committee's position um, as super consultee on the energy strategy. So if members are content to follow that process, uh, but it'll mean the, the committee has, has effectively looked at this uh, in as much detail as possible, but the, the signs that the department has picked up on the committee's cues um, is already looking as though it's there. Chair, the deputy chair wants to come in there. Yep, go ahead, Sinead. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I wonder, would it be um, appropriate for you as Chair to maybe go out to the other consultees that we have on um, our database and just encourage people uh, to get engaged 
with the energy strategy uh, and uh, to, be su to submit responses to it, because I think it's really, really important that we have really wide engagement right across the various sectors um, for this consultation. Yep. Yeah, Chair, we can go ahead and do that, and we'll also push it out over social media. So yeah. if we're tweeting, if members you know, want to um, retweet all that, then it'll just push it out that yeah. way further. Yeah, it's a, it's a really yeah. important strategy that is going to set the direction of travel for the next decade. So it is really important that it's in, as informed as possible. So we can do that, certainly. Yep. Moving on. Sorry, Chair, just one more thing, sorry. Um, one of the things about the consultation as well, there's an awful lot of questions in it. And, uh, and I'd be afraid that these questions, you know, the number, I, I, I offhand, I don't know, 79. but it's up in 79. It's an awful lot of questions. And it may put people off actually responding to it. And I think we have to let people know that they don't have to respond to every one of the questions. Um, they can pick and choose what they want to respond to. Because if you're faced with 79 questions, you kind of put it in a to-do tray that you think some other time would, would have lots of time. So, um, you know, we, we, we need to make sure that people don't feel obliged to respond to all of them. Yeah. No, fair point. Okay, we so we'll push that out, Chair, over social media. Thanks, Peter. We we'll move on then to item number eight, which is a, a research and information service paper on university funding. Very useful paper. Um, it's at page two hundred and twenty-seven of your pack, and it's to assist members in the scrutiny of the funding arrangements for higher education institutions. The committee requested a paper from Raise to assist its scrutiny of the funding of higher education a little while ago. The paper includes an overview of funding sources and comparisons with other jurisdictions. Um, an oral briefing from RAIS will be scheduled on this paper once members have had time to consider it. So it's just for us to note at this stage and a discussion uh, session on the paper will be scheduled when members can outline their views to help inform um, the committee position around it. Chair, it, it just pairs down um, the, the funding balances that have tended to become the, the the leading ones that are used over the last decade or so. Um, so if members are, are wanting to take that away, have a look at it. And then what we'll do is we'll schedule a slot to talk about the potential options going forward. Um, members are aware that the department is looking at this as part of its review of FE and HE and the cooperation and collaboration of the two and so on. Um, so it's important that the, the committee has a, a clear idea of just what potential funding options there are. Chair, the Deputy Chair is looking in as well. Go ahead, Sinead. I just want to offer congratulations actually to the Research and Information Service. It's a brilliant paper. Uh, it's very concise and um, it'll be uh, good to get a briefing from the, um, from, from the department as well, just on the content of that, but a really well written paper. Okay, thanks, Sinead. It is a good paper. Very we, helpful. We'll pass that on. Michael, Michael Scholes is the author. He'll be delighted. Mm -hmm. We're moving on then to item number nine, which is an SL1 on Employment Rights Act 1996, Coronavirus Calculation of a Week's Pay, NI Regulations 2020. There's a clerk's memo at page 276, and then the SL1 is at page 278. The proposed statutory rule amends regulations two and three of the Employment Rights Act 1996, Coronavirus Calculation of a Week's Pay, NI Regulations 2020, which were made necessary by the extension of the Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme until the 30th of September 2021. Um, consistent with the principal regulations as originally made, various statutory entitlements based on a week's pay and connected with the termination of employment are not reduced as a result of an employee being furloughed under the Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure. Um, and this is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1 as it's not possible to amend it once the rule has been laid and are made and laid in the Assembly Business Office. And if members are recall, we have supported this um, on previous occasions. So if members are content with the, the policy direction as outlined. Thank you. Yep. Okay, move on, on then to item number 10, which is the SR 2021-000, the Renewables Obligation Amendment Order NI 2021. There's a clerk's memo at page 286 and then the SR itself at page 287. The statutory rule amends the Renewables Obligation Order Northern Ireland 2009 to ensure that certification for combined heat and power quality assurance schemes is not adversely impacted by COVID and the change demands of customers and the impact on heat and power ratios. 
BES is implementing a minor legislative amendment to update the CHPQA standard, allowing, legislative, or allowing operators to submit 2019 data to maintain consistency of approach. A similar amendment to the Renewables Obligation Order NI 2009 is required to ensure that eligible operators here in the north are not disadvantaged. So this uh, statutory rule is subject to draft affirmative resolution procedure and the rule will come into operation on the 1st of June. The examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on this rule, so members will be agreeing to the legislation subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. And obviously we agreed the SL1 when it came to us, I think it was last week. Yeah. So members are content with the SR, we'll put the question that the Committee for the Economy has considered the SR 2021-000, the Renewables Obligation Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2021, and recommends that it be affirmed by the Assembly, subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report. Um, so, Peter, will we pause we'll there? we just pause there, Chair, and we're at 11 o'clock, members, so we're just going to take a minute um, to have a minute's silence for... International Workers' Memorial Day. Thank you, members. Thank you, everybody. Eva, would you... If you want to go back then to... Do you want well, to do that SR, SR first of all? SR, yeah, we'll get that. Yep. So we'll move then to item number 11, which is the SR 2021-106, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2021, Coronavirus Suspension of Liability for Wrongful Trading Regulations, NI 2021. The clerk's memo is at page 299 and the SR is at page 300. The SR extends until the 30th of June, the period during which liability for wrongful trading is suspended by the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Coronavirus Suspension of Liability for Wrongful Trading Regulations, NI 2020, SR 202320. This statutory rule is subject to confirmatory resolution procedure and the rule will come into operation on the 29th of April. The examiner of statutory rule has not yet reported on this rule, so members will be agreeing to the legislation subject to the examiner's report. So if members are content, we will put the following question. That the Committee for the Economy has considered the SR 2021-106, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act, 2020 Coronavirus Suspension of Wrongful or Liability for Wrongful Trading Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report. So we're going to move back now to item number five. Yes. Yep. Um, which is our closed session briefing from uh, Research Services. So we'll go into closed session now. 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. So we are now moving on to item number 12, which is correspondence. Um, and just we are 12.1 at page 308 of your pack. There is a copy of correspondence from the Committee for Education to the Economy Minister regarding measures and support provided by the Department for Young People and Adults with Autism in Further and Higher Education and Employment. So that's just to ask members to note at this stage. At page 311 then of your PACS 12.2, there's correspondence from the Finance Committee providing a copy of a list of issues it raised with the Executive Office, Finance Minister and Economy Minister following a raised briefing on the UK Internal Market 2020 and the Protocol. Um, and if members are content, we will consider the response from the ministers once we will receive those. So, moving on then to 12.3, at page um, 352, there's correspondence which I've sent to the committee in, in um, my party capacity regarding my private members' bill on um, the university's public mission agreement bill, um, and is outlined in the, the letter. It's to provide um, a degree of oversight and transparency between for for the department and for the public more generally um, regarding institutions receiving public funding and um, the consultation has just completed and we are now at the stage where we're, we're progressing that with the bills office so just to ask members to note at this stage and obviously uh, i look forward to engaging with the committee as it as it progresses um, and then at page 12 point or sorry point 12 12.4, there is correspondence from Martina Anderson, MLA, regarding her private member's bill on work-life balance, and, and that bill seeks to strengthen workers' rights in, in key areas such as statutory paid leave for those with care and responsibilities, the right to flexible working arrangements, and the right to disconnect from work outside business hours. So again, it's to note at this stage. Um, at 12.5, then, there is the copy of the 34th report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules, um, again to note. And then 12.6, at page 130 of Table Papers, there is a copy of the consultation on the review of the postgraduate tu tuition fee loan. The consultation will close at the end of June and it seeks the views on the current system of postgraduate support for students here undertaking top postgraduate study and discusses a number of options for potential reform. And members will know this is an issue that we have been raising with the department for some time. So if, if members are content, um, we'll be seeking the, to consider the results of the consultation and receive a briefing once that analysis is available. And I think Shania is looking to come in there. Thank you, Chair, and uh, just to say that I really welcome this review. Um, it, it's long overdue. It's about time our Northern Ireland postgrads are treated with equity and fairly in relation to engaging in, 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 in courses. Uh, and they've been left behind in a very uncompetitive situation that we find ourselves in. So it's very, very welcome. What I would um, suggest is, is that we ask uh, the research an information um, service to provide a small briefing and overview as well for the committee um, for for this um, for for postgrads funding um, because I think you know a, a brief synopsis would be very very good for us uh, in comparison to other jurisdictions. Uh, the, the the review paper from from the department is a bit confusing to be fair, and so I would like to see just a very short briefing paper from the research uh, and information services on this. Thanks. Thanks, Sinead. Yeah, Chair, we'll go ahead and commission that um, a comparative analysis and bring that back. Thank you. Thank you. And then twelve point seven, there is um, at page one hundred and thirty two of table papers a copy of the latest ISNI report. So that is for noting. So that's us in terms of correspondence. We're moving on then to item number 13, which is any other business. And Claire is indicating that she's wanting to come in there. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, unless I've missed something, um, is there any more detail in relation to FE College's return? And I put it in the specific context of uh, sick form students who are maybe coming from post-primary schools to, to use the facilities within FE Colleges. It has created a bit of a, a disadvantage or a discrepancy for those particular students. Um, I understand some are able to go back if it's particularly a practical element or if it's in relation to like close contact services courses. Um, but can we get a wee bit more detail or clarity of when that's expected, given where everyone else is in terms of education? Chair, we, we have an informal coming up with the FE Colleges. And, and just picking up on what Ms Sugden has said, I'm aware that some courses have gone back to face-to-face, -to -face, and I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. not 100% sure whether it's, as, as she says, the practical ones I know um, courses have resumed and the likes of hair and beauty and so on, yeah. but I'm not sure what, what else, if, if, it's, if it's just the practical hands-on, whether there's a need for assessment and so on, or whether others have come back to. So we, we'll get an update on that. As I say, we have the informal with the um, FE College principals fairly soon. Okay, uh, and if you don't, don't mind, Chair, as well, just can we specifically put it into the context of post-primary schools? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I visited a, a school last week and they were telling me that they have this situation where some of their sixth formers are just having to sit in a class because the course that they typically have went to within an FE college is not available to them because of the restrictions. Um, so, you know, I think there's, you know, a, a read across here as well and it's having an impact. Yes, no problem, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, unless there's anything else, um, item number 14 is the date, time and place of our next meeting, which is uh, next Wednesday morning, um, the 5th of May, here in room 30. And as we've already discussed, we have our informal meeting with the banks tomorrow morning at 10.30 via Zoom. So if members are happy enough, that's us for today. Thank you. Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.